I'd just like to welcome you to our webinar today, Federal Hiring 360. Um, thank you all for joining. We're very excited about today's webinar. My name is Marla Lazarus. I'm with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, but most importantly, before we get into anything, for all of you who are service members, veterans, families of veterans um, on the call today, just want to thank you sincerely and genuinely for your service. Um, your service to this country, your service to all Americans. So we celebrate you. Um, we hope everyone had a great Veterans Day yesterday, and we hope this information that we present today will be helpful for you and your families. So that's why we're doing it. We're here to help the military community. So we hope this information will be valuable to you. Um, the session today, as you heard, is being recorded. Um, it will be posted to our YouTube channel um, in a few weeks. Um, so it will be available to any and everyone um, who may have missed it, or if you missed some things during the presentation, you can feel free to play it back whenever you'd like. Um, the slides will also be sent to all registered attendees following this session. Um, so you don't have to worry about uh, feverish taking notes. Um, everything on the slides will be uh, sent to you following this session. Um, I want to reiterate that we are from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, all the presenters today. Um, we are hosting this webinar in partnership with the Department of Defense, the Defense, the Defense Health Agency. Um, and within the Defe Defense Health Agency, the Education and Employment Initiative and the Operation Warfighter Program. So we're very happy to have our colleague Denise Williams on the line today um, from the Defense Health Agency. Um, and also want to say that anybody who has any questions throughout this entire presentation, feel free to use the chat box. Um, my colleagues and I will be monitoring the chat box throughout the session. Um, so if you do have any questions arise, feel free to type them in the chat box. We'll respond directly in the chat box. We do have time at the end of the presentation. We may take some questions at the end as well. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen so I can pull up the slide deck here and we'll get right into it. Um, so again, thank you all uh, for joining today's session. This session is geared specifically toward the military community. While the information will be applicable to the general public, um, some of the information we share today is specifically for the military community, so thank you. There we go. Um, and so our agenda today, um, we are going to talk about uh, federal resume writing in particular. We're going to talk about the federal application process, again, specifically as it relates um, to the military community. We're going to talk about interviewing in a virtual world, and we are going to end with building your brand through LinkedIn. Um, with that being said, before we get straight into the agenda, I do want to go over, unfortunately, my colleague wasn't able to join us today, so I am going to go over just a quick overview about CMS. Um, so the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services is one agency within the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and we are the largest purchaser of healthcare in the entire world, um, responsible for one of our nation's most critical functions, obviously, the healthcare um, payment process. Medicare, Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program, and the Federal Health Insurance Exchanges are the programs that we are responsible for. We touch the lives of over 145 million people, including senior citizens, families, people with limited income, persons with disabilities, and many others. Um, our mission is to ensure effective, up-to-date health care coverage and promote quality care for beneficiaries. We are headquartered in Baltimore, Maryland. We're actually uh, located in Woodlawn, which is on the west side of Baltimore County, if any of you are in the DMV area. We also have 10 regional offices throughout the country. So here on this slide, you'll see where all of our 10 regional offices are. That last office, we have a satellite office in San Juan, Puerto Rico as well. So we are definitely nationwide. Um, and then the type of people that we hire varies widely. Um, and so while we are a healthcare policy organization, and that is our main function, kind of health administration, health policy. Um, so these are some of the position titles that we hire for in the health policy field. We are also just like any other um, uh, 
business uh, organization as well. So we hire media and communications professionals, public affairs specialists. We hire business finance, accounting, accountants, auditors, financial management specialists, budget analysts. We also hire a lot of uh, technology professionals and uh, STEM professionals as well. So in math and science, we hire IT specialists, actuaries, statisticians, data scientists are one of our um, up and coming positions as well. So just wanted to give you a quick overview of CMS in general. We will be talking some specifics about how to specifically apply to CMS. So we wanted to give you a little bit of information first before we get right into um, the nuts and bolts of today's presentation. So with that, um, I will turn it over to my colleague, uh, Tara Carpenter. Uh, she will be covering um, how to decode federal resumes. So Tara? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. I'm here. Hey, Tara. Thanks, Marla. Good afternoon, everybody. And I just want to echo Marla's words. Um, of thanking our active duty, our veterans and families um, for serving this country. And we will get right into the presentation. So what is a federal resume? A federal resume is an official application for open vacancies um, within the federal government for starting or advancing your federal career. You can think of your resume as your personal marketing tool to professionally present your experience and your education to an employer. It is your paper interview. Next, please. And in, when you're doing your federal resumes, you um, often consider uh, two types of resumes. There is a private sector resume and of course, there is a federal resume, and they are um, absolutely different. So when you're talking about private sector versus a federal resume, um, there are some vast differences, and we're going to go over here. When you are writing a resume for a private sector, it is generally one to two pages. Um, when you are writing for your federal resume, um, it can be three to five pages, but it also depends on your experience. If you have 15 to 20 years experience, your resume um, more than likely will be a lot longer. Um, for instance, I have 24 years federal service. My resume tends to be about eight to nine pages long. When you're talking about your writing style um, for a private sector resume, you're just using simple bullets. When you look at the writing style for a federal resume, you want to use small narrative paragraphs. Um, when you are looking for your keywords, you're just going to use industry language. Um, when you're writing your private sector resume, for a federal resume, you want to focus on keywords and skills. Um, when your resume is being reviewed in the private sector, um, it most likely will be scanned by software. When um, your resume is being reviewed in a federal sector, in a federal government, your resume is actually being looked at by an HR specialist. Um, when you look at the format for the private sector resume, um, a lot of times you'll see where the language is bold, italicized, capitalized, and you will have underlined text. Um, for the federal resume, if you um, use Resume Builder um, with, uh, in USA Jobs, um, you're going to want to capitalize the um, important details because you cannot bold, you cannot um, underline, you cannot use the bullets. When you submit your resume um, in a private sector, you will submit it uh, directly to the organization. Um, for the federal government, you will submit it through USA Jobs, and there are some occasions where you will have to submit it directly to the agency in a PDF format. Next page, please. So federal resumes are like shoes. One size definitely does not fit all. Um, when you 
um, begin to write your resume and you are communicating your qualifications, this should be the time that you really sit back and think about um, your skills, your expertise, things that you have accomplished in your career. Um, you wanna show that you can provide immediate results. You definitely wanna put your best foot forward. When we're talking about um, critical elements, your consistency and formatting is everything. You don't want to have different font, um, have your resume um, all over the place. You don't want it to be cluttered. You don't want your resume to be an eyesore. You don't want it to be um, a big blurb where it's hard for an HR specialist to see what your skills and experience is and you don't want a hiring manager to um, see it as an eyesore either. It makes it really hard to um, read and understand. So um, definitely want to make that resume very easy to read. And definitely you want to um, have your resume stand out. Um, there are a lot of people that are applying for positions sometimes and you definitely want to take the time um, for to build your resume so that it stands out. So when you're writing your resume, especially for the federal government, um, one thing I, I hope you would have done um, when you're applying to the job, looked um, and read, oh, look and read over the vacancy announcement very thoroughly, and you're going to look at those qualifications. And after you've done that, when you start to write your targeted resume, you want to make sure that you are clearly um, presenting key elements and keywords. You want to make sure that you are getting the attention of the HR specialist and that hiring manager. When you're dealing with your summary of qualifications, you want to make sure that you are being concise. Um, you may, you want to make sure that you're giving a lot of clear information in just a few words. You want to make sure that you are um, making sure that your experience is brief, but very thorough. And most importantly, you want to make sure that um, your work experience is relevant to the position that you are applying for. I'm sorry. So when we're talking about the outline format and we are not um, advocating any specific way, this is just the example that we're using for this presentation. As you see at the top, um, right above the example, they have all the keywords, the skills are in uh, capital letters. And you also, also see the capital letters at the beginning of each paragraph. You really want your, your skill set and accomplishments to stand out. You want to use small paragraphs instead of the bullets, and you definitely don't want to use the big block um, narrative paragraphs where they're all running together. Um, when you're describing your qualifications, you, you want to use intentional, meaningful, and effective language. You want to make sure that um, the hiring manager and the HR specialist can understand what your qualifications and experience are. All right. So when you're translating um, careers from military to civilian, next page, please. Um, there is a tool, this is for Maryland. I'm um, pretty sure there is this tool for other states. Um, but as you're transitioning out and you have, um, no matter what um, branch of the service you served in, um, you look at your MOS and you would put it in um, where it says military occupation code. And then once you've done that, um, it will give you a series of civilian jobs that you could apply for um, under the federal government. Next 
one thing um, I can't express how important this is, is to demilitarize your resume. Um, you have to, and a lot of people may not realize, I, I didn't as I transitioned out of the military. Um, a lot of times we expect when we do our resume that the person on the other side will automatically know um, what our military jargon is and they'll be able to translate it into civilian terms. That absolutely is not the case uh, most of the time. So you really have to take the time to um, break down your military experience and it has to be in civilian terms. So in this example, when we're looking at the inventory skills, um, you wanna think beyond the, spe the specific function. You wanna focus on the skill and your experience. For example, we're talking about a sharpshooter who led small teams, um, carried out high priority objectives with minimal room for failure in high pressure situations. That was the function um, of the sharpshooter's um, position. But what you wanna do is dig a little deeper. You wanna look at your skill and your expertise that it took to carry out this function. And in this, in this um, example, he was able to break down leadership. Um, he got ability to carry out work with minimal supervision, attention to detail. I know we all know that that's what they teach you in boot camp. And also the ability to work under strict deadlines. These were the skills and the expertise um, that he used to carry out the functions for the sharpshooter. Okay, when you're talking about your experience, um, you wanna give the full picture. You wanna think about um, your technical skills and you know this is your knowledge used to perform um, practical tasks in specific areas. You wanna um, think about your interpersonal skills. A lot of times we forget that, but those interpersonal skills are just as, as important. In the military, you work with all kinds of people, you work with all kinds of ranks. Um, so you definitely wanna include that um, on your resume. And then of course, your leadership skills. You want to um, show how, um, what you did with your leadership skills, like for communication, how did you motivate your staff? Um, how did you delegate um, authority and things of that nature? Next slide, please. So when you're translating your skills, here the example is for infantry um, to logistics management, and it is broken down into four steps. Um, in your first steps, you're basically looking at the uh, infantryman, whatever your uh, military occupation was, and you're kind of looking at what the function is for that job. When you go to step two, um, this step two is extremely important and something that you really should focus on. The more that you can quantify your experience, um, the better it is because it also helps your, um, your resume to stand out. And it, it's, it's impressive to an employer. When you look at the example here, um, they supervised, trained, and evaluated 40 personnel supported more than 2,000 troops in four countries, inventory lists, 15,000 line items, and the assets were um, valued at over $65 million. Um, these are definitely, um, when you can use data and quantify your experience, please do. Um, then when you get to step three, you're looking at your skills and your area of expertise that you used in your position um, as an infantryman. And then in your fourth step, um, when you are looking for um, positions in the federal, um, in effect with the federal government, you can kind of compare, not kind, you compare what you've done in the military. Um, you can use that, the, um, the tool, the resource tool, I'm sorry, the resource tool um, to put in your MOS 
and then it gives you the federal um, government positions that are possible possibilities. This would be an area where you can use that. But from step one, step two, and step three, um, you should be able to um, get a feel for what your experience would be and the positions that you would apply for with the federal government. Your federal resume do's and don'ts. So again, you want to quantify your experience and skills whenever possible. You want to make sure that you use numbers and data um, in your descriptions. This is impressive and it does help your resume to stand out. You want to tailor your resume to any position that you are applying for. You should be tailoring it to that vacancy announcement and putting in relevant experience. Um, when you are writing that resume, sometimes you want to write it. Writing a federal resume can take a lot of time. Um, it can be many pages. So sometimes you want to write that resume, then you want to step back from it and take a look at it again. Once you have um, completed your final resume that you are a version that you are happy with, um, I would also recommend that maybe having somebody else to look at this resume as well. It doesn't hurt to have an extra pair of eyes. And then um, when you are applying to um, a vacancy announcement, please take note of when that vacancy announcement closes. Um, it usually closes at 11.59 on a particular day. And if you, for some reason, um, submit that resume the next day, five minutes later at 12.05 a.m., say on a Wednesday, you're not eligible because you've missed that cutoff and that deadline. Next slide, please. Um, the things that you don't want to do, um, use your job description um, expressions where you put duties and responsibilities. Instead, you want to use accomplishments, your experience, your skill set um, for your personal information. Um, please, please do not include a picture on your resume. Um, you don't want to put your age, your date of birth, um, your race, marital status, and health. Also, you, um, you don't want to embellish. Please do not lie on your resume. You may um, get that resume through an HR specialist, but I can guarantee you at some point um, that embellishment is going to come out, whether that be in an interview with a hiring manager or once you start your position, um, you're not able to um, do the job that you said on your resume that you can do. And that can lead to um, a lot of uncomfortable situations. And then run one resume. You don't want to have one general resume for every position that you apply for. You want to tailor each resume to um, the vacancy announcement, um, especially after you're looking at the qualifications that the hiring manager is looking for. Please do not use a resume, a one type fit all resume. And again, I am Tara Carpenter. Um, I am the veteran coordinator for CMS. If you, any veterans are interested in um, employment with CMS, please don't hesitate to reach out. And also for um, veteran service organizations, if you are interested in a partnership, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much, Tara. I hope that everybody got a lot out of that. Um, I know it's certainly um, a lot of helpful information, especially uh, for those coming from the military or have served in the military before. So definitely appreciate all of the information. Again, just want to reiterate that the slides will be sent um, to registers attendees following this session. Um, so moving on, we are going to move on. 
My slides to go. Perfect. Um, so now we're going to be talking about the ins and outs of the USC jobs application process. So if anybody has applied on USC jobs before, you know that it can be rather cumbersome. Um, so we hope today to just break it down in its simplest form. Uh, a few things we're going to talk about first. Um, this is me. Sorry, Marla Lazarus again. Um, been with CMS for about 20 years. Actually, I think I just surpassed 20 years this month. Um, and one thing besides me that I probably they won't mention is our other two speakers, Tara Carpenter and Sean Forbes, are also military veterans. So, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you for your service. I'm going to take one sip of water. I'll be right back. Okay, thank you for your patience. Um, it never fails. Every single time I do a webinar, um, without exception, I always get a coughing attack. So hopefully I got it out early and I'm good to go for the next few um, topics here. So we are going to talk about um, a few things first before we really get into the nuts and bolts of USC jobs. Um, but just wanted to start with this quick quote. I saw it online. I thought it was very um, poignant. So job searching is like a pinata. If you hit it hard enough, you will be rewarded. Um, so that just basically is saying, don't give up. <coughs> Excuse me, apparently not completely done. Um, sometimes it's going to take a while. As recruiters, we talk to people all the time who have been applying for years to the federal government um, and eventually get in. And then sometimes we talk to somebody and they apply to one position and they got in on the first position. So it's going to be different for everybody. Um, but just remember, if you follow that advice that Tara gave to you earlier and some of the advice we're going to go over from here on out, um, you're going to be better positioned to, to um, get a job with the federal government. So moving on, there's a two main types of hiring paths within the federal government. There's the competitive path, which is basically um, in layman's terms, applying through USA Jobs, you're rated and ranked against all other candidates. That's the normal competitive process. There's also some non-competitive hiring paths that we're going to quickly go over today. Um, for those uh, hiring authorities, candidates who are eligible could be considered outside of the USA Jobs hiring process. The challenge, um, while these hiring authorities are fantastic and give agencies a more streamlined way to hire certain eligible candidates, um, the challenge for candidates is that a lot of agencies or most agencies have different type of application uh, procedures for these hiring authorities. So you kind of got to figure out um, the hiring uh, process and the application procedures for each individual agency. Um, in order to apply. So of course, we'll be going over um, the application procedures for CMS today. Um, and there are some ways that we'll talk about to um, find contacts at other agencies to find out their um, ways of accepting applications. So some of the special hiring authorities that I mentioned, one is the veterans recruitment appointment. Um, eligible veterans can be appointed at any grade level up to and including the GS-11. Um, so it's capped off the, the veterans recruitment appointment. Um, can, we can only hire at the GS-11 and below. It does not mean that once you are in the federal government, you couldn't be promoted to a higher grade level after um, initial appointment. Um, the 30% or more disabled veteran hiring authority is fairly self-explanatory. Anybody who has a 30% or more um, disability rating through the VA um, is eligible for this hiring authority and it allows for appointment at any grade level pending uh, your qualification for that particular position. And the uh, Veterans Employment Opportunity Act allows eligible veterans to apply and compete for positions that are typically only open to federal employees. So when you see positions on USA Jobs that typically say status or federal employees only, um, if you are eligible for the Veterans Employment Opportunity Act, um, then you would be able to apply to those positions. Um, some other special hiring authorities for military spouses. Um, they, um, eligible military spouses may apply and compete for positions, again, traditionally only open for federal employees. And if they do apply and are qualified for those positions, they can be referred non-competitively for those positions. In layman's terms, what that means, I know that doesn't, um, may not make a whole lot of sense to everybody on the call. When we refer people non-competitively, um, basically what it means is your application can be sent directly to that hiring manager outside of the traditional list of applicants that they're gonna get from USA Jobs. 
Um, and the last uh, hiring authority in this set is the Schedule A hiring authority for individuals with disabilities. While this hiring authority is available to any individual with a intellectual uh, disability, a severe physical disability, or a psychiatric disability, it is also open to veterans with those disabilities as well. So um, one of the main benefits of Schedule A for disabled veterans is that um, if you are recently transitioned out of the military, sometimes getting that rating from the VA can take some time. And so with that, um, you can actually obtain a Schedule A letter from any medical professional um, and it's used the same way pretty much as a 30% or more disabled veteran hiring authority in that you can be uh, hired for any position in which you qualify at any grade level. So um, it is a good alternative, especially to those waiting um, for their disability rating. Um, and the last three I'll cover very, very quickly, the Pathways programs for students and recent graduates, again, not exclusive to veterans, but veterans are certainly eligible to apply to these programs. Um, and I will mention that veterans preference is also applied to all of these programs. So the internship program is for any current student enrolled at least half time in a degree or certificate seeking program. Um, the recent graduates program is for any individual who has graduated um, with a degree or certificate within the previous two years. Um, eligible veterans who uh, were precluded from applying due to their military service could have up to six years um, from the time of graduation, depends on your situation. Um, and the Presidential Management Fellows Program is for advanced degree students or above. Um, and so you may apply with uh, during the year that you are about to graduate and the year following graduation um, for the PMF program. So now moving on to more of the application, the USC Jobs application, please. So if you're not familiar with Veterans Preference, I suggest um, you do some research on it. We'll go over it just a little bit today. So Veterans Preference um, is available to any disabled veteran or anybody who served on active duty in the armed forces during uh, certain specified time periods or in military campaigns. So there's a lot of detail and nuances around Veterans Preference and um, who gets it, how much you get of it. Uh, so here's just kind of a gist. And so I'm not gonna read all of this, basically a five point uh, veterans, uh, if you get five point veterans preference, you would meet any one of these eligibility factors. Um, a 10 point, veter uh, 10 point veteran, or if you get 10 point veterans preference, uh, typically you would be a dis disabled veteran with a service connected disability or have received a purple heart. Um, if you're still not sure, if you've never heard of Veterans Preference or you're still not sure um, what preference you do receive, uh, the Department of Labor has a fantastic Veterans Preference Advisor. Um, so you'll see the, the website address right at the top of um, this picture right here, right under the computer screen. Um, you can also just Google Department of Labor Veterans Preference Advisor. Um, it should be one of the first thing that things that come up. What it, will, what it will do is take you through a set of questions um, based on your military service. And at the end of the, based on the way you answer those questions, it will tell you what um, preference category that you fall into. Okay, so now we're moving on to the search, i.e. USA job search. Um, and so I'm gonna start kind of a little far back for those who may be a little more familiar with USA jobs, this will be a little bit of a refresher, but some of us are starting really from ground zero. So I wanted to really go back um, to the beginning. So this is the USA jobs homepage. Um, what you'll see if you do just an open search, if you don't type anything in keywords, nothing in location, you just do an open search for a position, you will see hundreds of thousands of positions um, posted throughout the federal government. Um, USA Jobs is essentially like the indeed.com of the federal government. So we are required to post almost all of our positions on USA Jobs. It is a very resourceful website um, once you get to know it and once you familiarize yourself with it a little bit. Um, so take some time, uh, but starting from step one, again, it's the official job site for, um, US, for government jobs. Um, you, after that, you want to create a profile for yourself. So that's kind of step one, even though it's step two here. Um, you want to create a profile for yourself. Uh, after you do that, you'll be able to create and or store up to five resumes. Um, and then you'll be able to also upload up to 10 uh, attachments. So the resume piece, you'll notice why um, 
or you'll understand why we say up to five is because you're going to want to kind of tailor your resumes as Tara talked about. And I'm going to talk about a little more um, as we get into the vacancy announcement um, anatomy itself. Uh, and then the attachments would be any supporting documentation. So any of your veteran documentation, your VA disability letter, Schedule A letter, your DD-214, um, transcripts. So any supporting documentation that you have that would either go to your qualifications and or eligibility, um, you want to make sure you upload into USA Jobs as well. Okay, so when you're filling out your profile information, um, there's a few questions in particular for veterans that you want to pay attention to. The first one is uh, your military service question. Have you served in the armed forces or are you a family member eligible for a derived preference? So that's going to be one question you see. You want to pay attention to that. Um, the next one is going to be a veteran's preference question. Do you claim veteran's preference? No, zero points, five points, 10 points, um, and based on which criteria, uh, especially for that 10 point preference. Um, and then the, the third one you want to pay attention to is a federal employee question. So just take note that only um, you only want to select that you have been a federal employee if you have held a civilian position before. Armed forces are not considered federal civilian positions. So here are some of the search features. And so as I mentioned, if you just do an open search, you're going to see thousands, hundreds, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of positions open. So you really want to use the search features that are available on USA Jobs to narrow down your search results. So you'll be able to narrow down, obviously, by keyword or location. That's what you saw right on that home screen there. But there's probably a dozen more filters that you'll be able to use to narrow down the position. So in addition to keyword or location, you can narrow it down by the hiring path, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, the agency, the job series, you can narrow it down by um, the pay, so the, the salary, um, any one of multiple filters you'll be able to use, use to narrow down your results, and I certainly encourage you to do that. Um, and the other thing I want to touch on here is once you do find a search that is um, really applicable to you, you're able to save that search. So you can use a save search function to um, one, go back to it anytime you want to and you know, see the new results that may come up for positions that um, meet your criteria. In addition to that, you're also able to name that search and then request to be emailed anytime a position is posted that meets the criteria that you've set for that search. So that's really beneficial to um, avoid having to look at USA Jobs you know, multiple times a day every day, because you'll, you'll see positions going up every single day from different agencies. At CMS, we post positions every day. Um, so in order to maybe not have to look so frantically every day, um, you can get emailed anytime a position is posted that meets your search criteria. So the hiring paths I just mentioned, um, this is the list of hiring paths that you'll see on USA Jobs now. They've really tried to streamline um, the website, but really get to the, the audience themselves and so they can find the most appropriate positions um, for them. So the first one you'll see is open to the public. So obviously that's going to be available to everybody. The second one you'll see is veterans. Um, you'll also see military spouses on there and a few others that you may um, fall into. So keep an eye on those hiring paths. The one thing you want to really um, pay attention to is if you just select open to the public, um, you will not see everything that you may be eligible to apply to if you are an eligible veteran that say is eligible for the Veterans Employment Opportunity Act. Um, because again, that particular eligibility and some of the other eligibilities, military spouses, allows you to apply to positions that may only be open to federal and current federal employees. And so by selecting the appropriate hiring paths, veterans or military spouses, it's going to open up the view for those additional positions that you may not see just if you click on open to the general public. Um, the other thing I'll call your attention to is at the bottom of that home page, you'll see an event section. Um, and that's important to keep an eye on. So we advertise all of our webinars on this event section. So you may find other um, either hiring affairs, webinars, information sessions that you may really be interested in on USA Jobs. A lot of agencies do um, advertise on USA Jobs. So keep an eye out for that. So now we'll get into really the, the ins and outs of the vacancy announcement itself. 
So as I mentioned, so the hiring paths are going to be visible. So this is, sorry, this view is when you click on an actual job vacancy. So let's pretend you've gone through all the filters, you've narrowed down your search results, you've identified a position that you could be interested in, you click on the position title, and then you open the vacancy announcement itself. This is the view you'll get at the top of that vacancy. Um, so at the top, you'll see here um, just kind of an overview, some demographic information for the vacancy. On the right-hand side of every vacancy, you'll see those hiring paths. So that's a good way to just kind of re-verify um, which uh, hiring paths this particular position is open to. So like on this one, you'll see it's typically going to be open to federal employees, as you'll see, but then military spouses and veterans are also listed on this particular vacancy. All right, so you'll see a lot of different sections um, within the vacancy announcement. It is so important that you read the vacancy announcement. So if I can't stress anything to you enough, it's to just read it. Um, it's a little cumbersome. Sometimes they're a little wordy, um, but it's worth the time that it takes to read it. So you may be missing something that's of, of extreme important, importance if you skim over it or don't read every section. So my suggestion to everybody is to read every vacancy announcement. The duty section, specifically the responsibility section, is going to be important um, because this is really where you're going to determine or, or use really to help to decide if the position is a good fit for you. Um, and so this should really talk about maybe not every single thing a person would do day, day to day, but the general gist of the position. Um, so what you'll find in federal civilian uh, positions, probably much like the military, is that we tend to use a few position titles and overuse them for everything. So the position title itself may not be a very good barometer of what you would do in that position. So for instance, health insurance specialist in our agency is the most commonly used position title. Almost 50% of our agency are classified as health insurance specialists. Um, so they do obviously a, a huge range of different things depending on what department they fall into. So really taking a look at the responsibility section is gonna help you determine whether this would be a position of interest for you. So if you scroll down, um, the next section we you will come to is the qualification section. So this is definitely the most important section of the vacancy announcement. You wanna read through this with a fine tooth comb. Um, so I'll just touch on a few things of extreme importance here. Um, in, every in every qualification section, you're going to basically see some standard language um, it's going to say something like, and it just is going to vary, obviously, depending on the position and depending on the grade level. It's going to say something like, in order to qualify for the GS-11, you must meet the following. You must demonstrate at least one year or 52 weeks of specialized experience equivalent to the GS-9 level. So obviously, if you've never been a civilian federal employee, that doesn't mean much to anybody that's not already a civilian employee. Um, so with that, you want to continue reading on um, and this is the part you really want to pay attention to. Obtained in either the private or public sector um, of importance is the following things. And so these are the, the actual qualification requirements that you want to pay attention to the most. And so for, it's going to, again, the, the, the wording in this particular vacancy is not going to be applicable to everyone, obviously. But in this particular one, it says applying quantitative methods to analyze the effectiveness of public health program, repair reports response, and responses applicable to healthcare. So that, it doesn't matter. Just pay attention to whatever it says for the position that you're um, looking at. The most important thing is to make sure that those things, typically it's going to be about, I'd say, two to four things. It is of the utmost importance that those things are addressed in your resume. Without those things, more than likely you will be deemed not qualified for the position. So you need to make sure you address those particular qualifications in your resume somewhere. For some positions, and you'll see on this slide as well, you can substitute education for experience. Um, that typically comes at the GS 11 level or lower. Um, so if you are applying for a GS 7 or a GS 9 position, 
Um, you could substitute education for experience for some positions that will all be outlined in this section. And then if you keep reading both below that, you can see you can also uh, combine education and experience. So if you have some education, some experience, um, that is a possibility, uh, possible way to qualify as well. So the qualifications from the vacancy, like I mentioned, must be reflected in your resume. The resumes, uh, so here's where the, the up to five resumes come into play. They should be amended at least to ensure that qualifications are stated for each position. So I'm not suggesting that you need to rewrite your resume in great detail for every position that you apply for. What I am suggesting is that tweaking your resume a bit and at the very least ensuring the qualifications that are stated in the vacancy are reflected in your resume are absolutely mandatory. Um, and human resources will not make assumptions about your, about your qualifications, so you need to be clear. If you think, oh, this is, you know, what I did, um, as a logistics officer is kind of inferred and you know everybody knows what they do and I don't have to be, don't assume, right? So uh, HR will not assume anything about your resume. You need to write it out and be clear in your qualifications. Okay, so coming down again um, to the requirements section, I wanted to point out one more thing. So um, again, this is under qualifications now, this is going to be for CMS in particular. Um, vacancy announcements throughout USA Jobs will likely have this um, option somewhere in the vacancy announcement. It may just be written a little differently and it may be located in a different place on the vacancy. But essentially, um, for every vacancy, you're going to have to answer application questions and what we call an occupational questionnaire. So that's when you click the apply button you go through the application, you'll upload your resume, you have to upload all your documents, but then you'll go through um, questions that you'll have to answer, and it's typically multiple choice questions now. Um, you'll be able to preview those questions before you actually hit apply and go through all the steps to get there. You can preview those questions. It's, a, it's also a good barometer of whether you'd be interested in that position or not, because the manager kind of chose those questions as, things they're interested in in seeing applicants, and it gives you a sense of the position itself as well. Um, and all of the questions will be experience or knowledge based. So I have experience in analyzing policy. And the answers will be everything from I do not possess this experience all the way up to I'm an expert at this. Um, so, and then everything in between. So you'll be able to answer those questions appropriately based on your knowledge and experience. Um, but just wanted to point out that you are able to preview those questions before you actually go through the whole process of applying. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, tailoring your resume um, will be important. Um, again, not necessarily rewriting your resume every time, but tailoring it um, can go a long way. Um, as I mentioned, the application questions can be reviewed uh, before click, um, applying under the qualifications section. One thing I do, this is not mandatory, um, but one thing I do, in addition to ensuring that the qualifications, the thing we went over before in the qualifications section are absolutely reflected on my resume, I also go through those applications as well. And if it's asked me if I'm, you know, have experience analyzing policy and I say that I'm an expert, I'm going to go back to my resume and make sure that it's also reflected in my resume somewhere. The reason being is because the manager is the one who really wants to see that in your resume and while you may be deemed qualified for that position, you still have to kind of make it through the hurdle of, hey, I'm a manager, I'm looking at resumes and I want to interview this person. So you want to put yourself in the best light. So taking note of those application um, positions prior to submitting your application is probably going to help you in the long run. So in a nutshell, you definitely want to take the time to invest um, in analyzing the vacancy announcement. Um, so it's going to it's going to uh, demand a little more time up front, 
Um, but what you'll find is if you're applying to the same types of positions um, throughout the government, and especially if you're applying to similar agencies or the same agency for different positions, you'll see a lot of common denominators in the vacancy. So you'll have to do less tweaking and less tailoring to your resume as you're continuing to apply to similar announcements. Um, but you definitely want to create a resume that targets your experience in the context of that announcement. So I've seen a few position uh, questions in the chat box about how much um, <clears throat> how much should I include in my resume? I have 15 or 20 years of experience in this particular field. And you definitely want to include the experience that is relevant to the position you're applying to. What I didn't say is take it completely out if it's not relevant, um, but you absolutely want to include it if it's relevant. And then what I would focus on if it maybe is not as relevant to the position you're applying to is again, as Tara mentioned, those skill sets, those transferable things that you've learned from those positions, um, I would focus more on those for, the, for your older experience. Um, okay, so I'll quickly cover, before we go into the next topic, I just wanna do a quick time check. Um, quickly cover the ways to apply to CMS positions. So I mentioned um, every agency may be a little different in how to accept applications, especially non-competitive applications. Um, so I'll cover how we do it at CMS. Um, so obviously you can apply to any position that you're eligible for and that you're qualified for on USA Jobs directly. Um, I'll back, back up one step and, and just, um, say that we encourage you to apply multiple ways. So you don't have to choose one way to apply. Um, you can apply in multiple methods, multiple avenues. It's just gonna give you a better chance for consideration. Um, if you identify a position on USA Jobs, you may apply directly online. If you are eligible for a non-competitive hiring authority um, that we discussed earlier, you may also email your resume and all of your supporting documentation to the HR specialist that's listed at the bottom of the vacancy announcement. For CMS, you will see a person's name and email address at, on every vacancy. Um, so you may take that email address, email again your resume, all your supporting documentation, um, and that supporting documentation has to be what makes you eligible for that hiring authority. So if you're applying to a 30% or more, you're gonna need to include your DD-214, and your VA disability letter. Um, if you're applying through Schedule A, you're gonna need to include your resume and Schedule A letter. Um, again, you're, if you're applying through the Veterans Recruitment Appointment, your resume and your DD-214 at the least, uh, potentially your VA disability letter if that is um, how you're eligible for VRA. So all of those um, things you can just apply, you can just send to the Human Resource Specialist listed on the vacancy. In addition to that, again, in addition to, not instead of, you may also ask to be entered into our CMS resume database. We house a non-competitive resume database for all eligible candidates who are eligible for any of our non-competitive authorities. Um, our managers have access to this database real time. Um, they can access it at any time when they're thinking about filling a position, actively looking for to fill a job. Um, and so they have access to all of the applicants in our database. All you need to do is email Tara, who you heard from earlier, um, with your resume, again, all your supporting documentation and your geographical preference is also important. We note that in the database because we have managers from all over the country accessing the database. Um, so if you're interested in you know, Baltimore, which is our headquarter office, but also possibly willing to relocate to one of our other regional offices or anywhere in the country, We'll be able to note that in the database as well. So uh, you'll see Tara's email address here. Again, um, just want to reiterate, we'll be sending these slides out as well. Um, and here's just a few resources for you. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this, but just wanted to provide um, you guys in these slides some resources where we've gotten some of this information from. And I will point out one, Feds, feds Hire Vets. Um, is a really, really great resource um, for anybody in the military community. All of those non-competitive hiring authorities I talked about, it goes over all of the eligibility in, in great detail. So you'd be able to get a lot of information from Feds Hire Vets. So we're gonna move right into the next topic. Um, we're doing pretty good on time. So um, I am also gonna be your presenter for the next topic, uh, interviewing in a virtual world. So what we know about today's world is we are all home. Um, so 
it is unfortunate for a lot of us. Um, some of us are taking advantage of it, but what we wanted to give to you is some tips and tricks. Um, not only interviewing, it will certainly be, uh, come in handy for interviewing in general, um, but certainly interviewing in a virtual world where most of your interviews are gonna be taking place online. So almost everyone will make a good first impression, but only a few will make a good lasting impression. So the common theme of this particular section is really to make a lasting impression, right? So you can make a good first impression and a manager can be hiring 10 people and everybody makes a good first impression. But what you really want to do when all the 10 of those interviews are over, you want to be remembered by that hiring manager. So that's what we're going to focus on today. So setting the stage is so important, especially for virtual interviewing. So you want to test your technology. This is so, so important. Um, you want to familiarize yourself with whatever platform is being used. So we at CMS use Zoom. Um, that's our most commonly used platform. But other agencies might use Skype. Um, they could use um, Google Meet. They could use any other platform. So you should have information on what platform you were going to be interviewed over um, prior to the interview. So once you have that, familiarize yourself with that platform. Test your device. Make sure all of your updates on your computer are complete. The last thing you want to do is like turn on your computer 10 minutes before your interview and then you have an update and that update takes 30 minutes right so you want to make sure all your updates are complete you want to test your camera if you have um kiddos you might need to wipe off your camera right so we need to to be mindful of our surroundings you want to test your mic if you're using headphones definitely test your headphones and please 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 make sure your devices are charged up or on the charger while you're um doing your interview so setting the scene is just as important as testing everything. So you wanna make sure you're in a quiet area. Quiet means quiet from electronics, from pets, from family members. Obviously a lot of us are home these days. Um, so you wanna make sure you get in a quiet area. Um, windows, a lot of times we don't think about this. It is getting colder on the Northeast, but, um, and, and throughout the country, so, some, some of us don't have our windows open anymore, but just things going on outside around us, you wanna make sure to have your windows closed. Um, you want to have a plain or professional background. Um, and so not every platform will allow you to have a virtual background. Um, so what we suggest is either just have a plain wall behind you or just something professional behind you. Um, let's see if I can take this off. Um, so if I take off my virtual background, it'll take me just two seconds, you'll see you're in my kitchen right now, right? So that's not a very professional background if you're conducting an interview. While we all understand that we're home, I don't want you to feel like, I don't want the interviewer to feel like, like they're having lunch with me, right? So I want it to be professional. I would just get behind a plain blank wall if I didn't have like a nice plant or a bookshelf or something like that. So I'm gonna go ahead and put my virtual background back on. Um, so again, minimizing distractions, setting the scene. Um, you want to have a stationary device. You don't want to be holding a device. So even if you have to use your phone, that's completely fine. But just make sure you set it somewhere so it's stationary. It's very hard when an interviewer is looking at somebody and they're moving a little bit the whole time. Um, and you want to make sure you silence notifications on that device. So a lot of us think about silencing things around us, um, but we don't remember to silence it on that particular device. So if you're using your phone, just put it on silent. So you, every time you get an email or text message, it doesn't ding. And sometimes, depending on the device and the platform, the interviewer can hear that. Um, okay, so the next and one of the most important things is to check your video. Um, so you'll see some examples on here, which are not always so great. Um, a lot of us have been in this kind of Zoom environment or video teleconferencing environment for some time now, and some of us have not. Some of us have not had the um, uh, chance to use it as much. So just wanted to give you some quick tips about your video. Um, one, you wanna make sure your, uh, your device or your camera on your device is about eye level, right? So you don't want to have, let's just say, from like here, you don't want to be looking down at your computer. You don't obviously want to be looking up to your computer. I am, as you saw, sitting in my kitchen. I'm at my island. 
but I also have my laptop on about a two inch box and that puts it right about eye level for me. Um, you want to make sure your lighting is good, right? So you, lighting is so important. So quick tip, you want to be front lit. So no matter what, you never want to sit um, in front of a window with the window behind you um, because that's going to typically give you backlighting and make it look like a shadow. Um, so if you see the, the example of the woman in the top left corner, she's right in front of a window and she's kind of uh, comes across darker because the, the lighting is coming from behind her. Um, so I am sitting in a pretty well lit room, although it's a gloomy day here in Baltimore, so it's not a whole lot of natural light. Um, natural light is best. Uh, but I have my overhead lights in my kitchen on. I have some uh, spotlights over my island. I also have a desk lamp. So if you do have a desk lamp, um, that is a really great kind of quick fix. I'm not saying to go out and buy one, but it is a great quick fix if you already have one on hand. So if you see, I'll turn it off. It's not that much of a difference, but it just with it on, it just gives you a little brighter look. Um, so lighting is very important. Um, and make sure you kind of look for glare and make sure you don't have a glare in your video. And then you don't want to sit too close or too far away, right? So you'll see the gentleman in the lower left-hand corner. All you see is like his face, like that's okay, but it's not like the best thing an interviewer wants to look at the entire time. So you also don't want to be too far where you see your whole body. So we typically say about chest and above or shoulders and above um, is going to give you kind of the best framing um, for your video. Um, so again, focusing on lasting impressions, you definitely want to do your research on the company before you have your interview. Um, plan your questions. It is so important, even if the interviewer doesn't ask if you have any questions, have some ready anyway. It just shows that you're prepared, you're interested, and you're engaged. Um, another thing that came up during one of our recent webinars with some managers was asking questions that might have come up, come up during the interview that's related to some of the questions they asked also shows that you were paying attention and engaged. But if you're not, if you can't think that quickly on the fly, definitely have some prepared questions um, that are not readily available on an employer's website, right? So you don't wanna ask a whole bunch of questions that you can just go to their website and look up easily. Um, so put in a little time, do your research, plan your questions. Also dress the part, right? So you just wanna think in-person interview. It doesn't matter that we're all home. You wanna make a good lasting impression and doing that in a sweatshirt is probably not the way to do it. Um, so just think in-person interview, dress how you would dress in an in-person interview. The worst you could that could happen is you feel overdressed and in that case it's probably a good thing. Okay so now it's show time. So the average length of a typical interview is about 45 minutes. Um, first inter if for virtual interviews that could be a little shorter so don't get discouraged if the interview is a little shorter but that's about average. Practice, um, but don't memorize. Uh, so you definitely don't wanna feel like you're reading from a script, um, but you do wanna do some research on common interview questions. So what I want everybody to do is look up behavioral-based interviewing questions online. So just do a quick Google search of behavioral-based interviewing questions. Um, this is what a lot of employers are using now, uh, including CMS. Um, and some examples of behavioral-based questions are this. Give me an example of a time that you faced a conflict um, while working on a team, right? So it's not like, have you ever faced a conflict before? It's gonna be very uh, experience-based. Tell me about a time, um, what was going on when this happened? So it's gonna be explanation-based questions. So what I would suggest is, there's a few categories and they're gonna shift um, a little bit depending on the position that you're applying for or interviewing for, but there are some common themes. And so some of those common themes are like customer service, teamwork, adaptability, communication, conflict resolution, time management, values, management style, if you're applying to a management position. So all of those are categories that you'll be able to find some like commonly asked um, behavioral based interviewing questions on, do some research and have some examples already queued up in your mind. You definitely don't want to be 
um, afraid of the silence in the interview. So if you're asked a question and you need a second to think about it, talk about this in a minute, but take that second and think about it. Um, but if you haven't done any research and you're not prepared at all for this, it's gonna take you a while to think about different examples in your history where you've come across these situations. So definitely do some time, prepare behavioral-based interviewing questions. Again, lasting impressions, you want to monitor your body language. Um, I have a huge problem with posture, right? So I'm often like sitting like this. So um, I did not do this today. Normally I put a pillow behind my back, which kind of like makes me sit up a little bit. Um, I failed on that today, but think about that for the future. Don't make my mistakes. Um, think, just think in person, right? Be, act the same way you would act in person. You don't want to slouch or act uninterested. You sit up, you smile, you're going to seem more engaged um, and make more of a lasting impression on that manager. It's really hard to do that, or it can be really hard to do this during a virtual interview, but try to make a connection as much as possible. Um, having a quick chat, be personable. Um, those things are harder to do, but not impossible to do. Um, so if you have a little bit of time before the the interview starts, definitely um, try to make that connection. Believe in yourself. This is so, so important. I believe you exude the confidence um, uh, that you feel internally. Uh, so authenticity is key. You wanna definitely have confidence with a little bit of side of humility. You don't wanna seem arrogant, um, but confidence is a very attractive quality. So believe in yourself. <clears throat> And then some common virtual courtesy um, pieces. So one, and these things are, are really just exclusive to virtual. Let the other person finish speaking. And as soon as I said that, it's not really not exclusive to virtual. You always want to let the other person finish speaking. But it's really easy to talk over to somebody, talk over somebody and get kind of like tongue tied in a battle when you're virtual. So we've all been on those either audio calls or virtual calls where we, you both start speaking at the same time and it's like, no, you go ahead, no, you go ahead. So if you just let the person finish speaking and finish their whole thought, um, that will go a long way. And what can help with that is signaling when your answers are complete. So a simple like head nod to say like, oh, I'm done, that can really help over a virtual setting. Um, in addition to that, what I do want to go back and, and mention one piece of time again is taking that pause um, when you're asked a question. So it is completely acceptable when you're asked a question, an interviewing question to say, I need a second to think about that. But if you don't say that and you just take the second, sometimes managers may think you're frozen. Um, there was a problem with the technology. So if you just say, that's a really good question. I just take take a second to to you know find my best answer. Um, that would go a long way in helping the the give and take of the virtual interview. And then finally, following up. So I believe it is important to follow up. Some managers are um, more concerned. Some are less concerned. I would say what is appropriate is a thank you email within about twenty four hours after the interview. Um, and what is equally as important is not to follow up too much. Um, and so managers are typically interviewing several candidates for one position. Um, what they don't want to do is um, have to field questions, you know, every other day or every other week from candidates about their status of the position. So what I encourage everybody to do is one of your questions at the end of the interview, if the manager is not forthcoming with this information, is to ask when they expect to make decisions. Many managers will just offer this information. If they don't, make sure you ask that question. So if the manager says, you know, it'll be about three weeks before I make a decision, at least you have a good um, sense in your head about how long it's going to take for that decision to be made. Not all managers may follow up. It is very common for managers to follow up with everybody they've interviewed. It may not be the case 100% of the time. So once that three weeks has surpassed, plus some time, I would say that would be the time, the next time it would be appropriate again for you to follow up if you haven't heard anything thus far. So with that, I will take a break, give my voice a break and um, be happy to introduce our final speaker, um, Sean Forbes. Again, just wanna mention that Sean and Tara are both veterans um, from our military and Sean will be talking about building your professional brand through LinkedIn. So Sean, uh, stage is yours. 
Hey, Marlon, thank you, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, everyone else watching right now, you know, thanks for joining today, and you know, thank you for your service. Uh, also, thanks for the lot of great questions going on in the chat right now. Um, you know, please keep them coming. You know, we're we're happy to help. That we're we're here to answer. Um, so one of the things we're going to be talking about today is building your brand through LinkedIn. Um, really, LinkedIn is a a really vital tool in not only your job search, but in uh, your ability to network and to be recruited. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And, oh, well, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Sean, as Marla mentioned. I'm a, I'm a retired Navy chief. I spent 20 years in both active and reserve. So I've seen a little bit of, you know, the both sides of the house and, uh, you know, kind of how to apply that to a resume and, you know, for, for stuff like this in, uh, in LinkedIn. Uh, next slide. So some of the things we're going to be talking about is why LinkedIn is important. We'll do a, a quick uh, profile review of, of a LinkedIn profile. And we'll also look at a, a couple, uh, I'll talk about some helpful resources. Uh, one of those being a, a one year uh, free premium subscription. So let's just jump right into it. So why LinkedIn? Uh, so LinkedIn really, it's, it's about networking. There's over 150 million registered users uh, on the platform. Um, so you know, that, that's really, it's really helpful to, you know, start those contacts, you know, early, especially if you're transitioning out of the military. Um, reach out to people you know, because there's a good chance that somebody you know knows somebody, you know, in, in the field that you're looking to get into. So, um, you know, you, you make a lot of, uh, you know, strong, uh, you know, networks and, and, and friendships, you know, in the military, you know, use those networks. Because um, like I said, there's a good chance, you know, somebody may know someone that you're looking to get into. Um, you know, the next one would be a job search. There's over 20 million active jobs on LinkedIn right now. I mean, it's one of the biggest job boards out there. And, you know, there, there's a good chance that you're going to be able to find, uh, you know, kind of what you're looking for. And not, I will say, not with a lot of government positions that are on LinkedIn, but I will say a lot of private sector positions give you the ability to apply directly from LinkedIn. Um, you know, which is a really nice and, and helpful feature, um, you know, that a lot of, a lot of private companies offer. Uh, and so lastly, I would say, so recruiting. So there's over 20,000 companies on LinkedIn, uh, you know, that use it as a, their, as a recruiting tool. I know for us, it's one of our primary recruiting tools. Um, you know, as a recruiter with CMS, um, you know, I, I would say it's it's our it's our go-to when we're looking for candidates and trying to source candidates for open positions we have. But I would say just industry, you know, throughout the U.S., that 94% of recruiters use LinkedIn. Uh, so having an an up-to-date and active profile. Um, one second. So having an active and up-to-date LinkedIn profile will really, one, help you with your job search and help recruiters find you. So that being said, Marla, I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. All right, so we're just gonna, kind of briefly go over a, a LinkedIn profile, some of the things to look out for, and uh, you know, some, some kind of tips and, and techniques you can use uh, you know, to, to make your, your profile more complete. Uh, so like I said, there's over 150 million users in the US. Um, you know, both federal agencies are using LinkedIn as, as well as private sectors to find and source candidates. Uh, so, the, so the most important thing is your LinkedIn profile. Um, you know, this tells, you know, this tells prospective employers everything about you. 
Um, so first things first, uh, you, should, you should have a profile picture. Um, it's really more so for LinkedIn and their algorithm because the more complete your profile pic or your more complete your profile is, the more likely you're you're going to show up in searches. So with with a profile picture, you're 14 times more likely uh, to be viewed and to show up in, in search. Um, you, know, you can you, we say use a professional photo. Um, that doesn't mean you have to get professional headshots done. That's, you know, it, it can be, you know, it could be your phone, um, you know, with just kind of, you know, a blank, uh, you know, background or just kind of a, a professional setting. I mean, you know, you can do that with a smart, you know, a, your cell phone. I, I would avoid a selfie to have somebody take the photo for you. Um, but it, it absolutely can be a, a picture from a phone. Um, the next we'll get into is, you know, this, the summary, this is, this is kind of the, the heart of your profile and what you're looking to do. Um, you know, talk about, talk about your, you know, your, your history, you know, your background, um, you know, what your kind of what your strengths are, what you're looking to get into, um, and, and any like high level, um, accolades that you, you would like to highlight. Um, you know, as Tara said earlier, you really want to demilitarize your resume. Well, it's the same thing for LinkedIn. Um, you know, you really want to put that into, you know, private, uh, you know, private sector or even, you know, for this, this public sector um, experience or just language. Um, so, so moving to experience, um, you know, this is again about profile completeness. Uh, you know, make sure you list your, your experience. You can, you know, I've seen, uh, you know, I've seen people in the military, they, they do it as one block, but, you know, as, as we all know in the military, you just don't have, you know, one job or, or one position the entire time. So it's perfectly okay to sort and segment by, you know, different commands that you were with. Um, you know, so, you know, lit, even if it's, you know, every three years, just list your role, um, and, you know, what you did, and then in any highlights you want uh, to, uh, to showcase here in this experience portion. Um, you know, multimedia, you can add, uh, you know, if there was, you know, news articles, or you have presentations or graphics or videos that, you know, you've been featured in, or you want to share along with your with your experience, you can uh, kind of essentially attach this to your experience and whether it's a link or a video, you can kind of embed that, um, you know, to show employers, um, you know, really what, you, what you've done. Uh, volunteer, you know, you know, an experience, uh, volunteer experience and causes. So, um, you know, I know personally, we, we do, a, we did a ton of volunteer work you know, within the military, some of it may have been voluntold, but uh, you know, it was still it was still volunteer experience that we did out in the out in communities. You know, so make sure you you absolutely capture that and and highlight that here. Uh, skills. So this is one of the the main points I want to kind of hone in on. Um, if you take away anything from me today, it's really really just update your skills on LinkedIn. So this is how, this is how recruiters are searching. So I would say about 95% of my searches on LinkedIn for candidates, I'm, I'm using a skill-based search. Um, so you really wanna make sure you think through what skills that you're, that you're listing on LinkedIn and make sure they correlate you know, to the position that you're, or the field that you're looking to get into. Um, so, I, I mean, I can't, I can't stress that enough. And also be sure to, you know, add a veteran to your, your list of skills as well. Um, but yeah, so like I said, when I, when I search, do a, a search on LinkedIn, I'm primarily using skills to find candidates. And that's when I'll go from there to, you know, reach out or contact them. Uh, if, if needed, but absolutely, please go through your skills. I know, you know, plenty of military folks have, 
you know, program, you know, analyst experience, um, data, you know, analytics, leadership, um, you know, make sure you, you capture those here in, in this skills section. Um, you know, education, like, you know, obviously if you, if you went to any college or any, you know, technical training, um, you, the military offers, you know, a ton of leadership schools and training, make sure that's all captured in here as well. Um, you know, it, it does matter. You know, any, any organizations you're with, you know, make sure, make sure you capture that as well. Uh, again, so it's really part of LinkedIn's uh, algorithm. The more complete your profile is, the more you're going to show up in searches. Um, you know, I, I think LinkedIn thinks of it as, you know, you being, you know, active users. So they want to put active users in front of employers that are, you know, actively searching for candidates. Um, recommendations, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about this. It used to hold a lot of weight, but I, I think LinkedIn's, you know, slowly getting away from the endorsements and recommendations. Um, and then, so groups, this is really just, uh, you know, any groups you wanna follow, there, there's a, a ton of, of veteran uh, resource groups out there and, you know, make sure you, you can join those and, you know, ask questions and, you know, stay up to date, even if just not, um, you know, if not veteran groups, but, you know, groups of, you know, the industries or fields that you're looking to get into. And, and following is just, uh, you know, agencies or companies you follow that, that'll, you know, show up in your newsfeed. And this way you can stay up to date. A lot of, uh, you know, I know we do it as an agency as well, post a lot of news or, or updates or, uh, you know, upcoming webinars and, and job announcements. Um, you know, so make sure you're following the, those companies and organizations um, that you're, you know, that you're looking to get into. Uh, so I know that was a lot for just the profile review, but again, I can't stress enough, um, you know, profile completeness and really, you know, update your skills. Um, and so one more thing that we'll talk about is just some helpful resources uh, from LinkedIn. I'm going to attempt to share my screen a second time. We'll see how this works. Marla, can you see the, it's empowering our veterans on LinkedIn? Yep, we're good to go. Okay, thank you. So, LinkedIn ha has a ton of resources uh, for veterans. Um, the biggest one being they offer a free uh, one year premium subscription, um, you know, to, to active duty and to veterans. Um, and what the premium subscription does is uh, you'll be able to use, I think they have over 10,000 courses um, that you'll be able to sign up for and take. And, and these courses, you know, they're anything from Excel to uh, graphic design, uh, technology, and, and business type courses that you can you can take on LinkedIn and then you can add to your profile and those will show up uh, in your in your education section of your profile. And the other thing I'll do is uh, you'll be able to reach out and contact uh, you know recruiters and things like that. So it's a, it's a really great uh, you know, free, you know, offer from LinkedIn for, uh, for, for veterans. Um, they also offer, so I would say it's a lot more in depth than just what we walked through, but they, they also have a tutorial for, you know, updating your LinkedIn profile and, you know, talking about photos and things like that. Um, and then they also have some, some pre-recorded webinars on transitioning to civilian employment and uh, transition to student life. Um, but yeah, so a lot of great opportunities. I'll share this link in the chat, um, but, but that's it for me. Thank you so much, Sean. Hope everybody got a lot out of that. That was definitely information packed. Um, I see some people already commenting that it was some great information. So thank you again so much. Mm -hmm. I am going to 
go ahead and share this last slide here um, as we wrap up. So um, just want to, again, thank everybody for their participation today. We hope you got a lot out of it on this last slide. You'll see some uh, contact information and, and email addresses that you can follow up with us if you have any additional questions. The chat box had some great questions I saw. So I hope um, everybody got their questions answered. Um, if you have any general um, inquiries, CMS recruitment at cms.hhs.gov is a great resource. Um, myself, you can always email me directly. Tara, again, is our veteran recruiter. You can email Tara directly, tara.carpenter at cms.hhs.gov. Heather Campbell, again, wasn't able to join us today. She focuses on university recruitment recruitment. Um, so you can always email her as well. So on behalf of CMS and on behalf of the Defense Health Agency, specifically the Education and Employment Initiative and the Operation Warfighter Program, um, we were glad that you could join us today. We hope you got a lot out of it. Um, again, happy, happy Veterans Day to everybody on the call. And again, thank you all for your service. So thanks a lot. <laughs>